Ted, you know the phrase. You say it better than anybody. How great is ball? And the tour goes on. We're now at Stanford, your backyard. This team, it's like people can sleep on them, but they're just going to keep getting 10 wins. It happens year after year after year. What are you most excited about as we're about to talk to Coach Shaw and a couple star players? Well, it's first of all, Yo, this is phenomenal because we're having one of a, two, maybe three stretches a year in the Bay Area where it's 95 degrees. <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, a lot of places in my house here, we don't have air conditioning because we don't generally need it here. So this is one of those strange weeks, and it'd be fascinating to watch Stanford practice um, in the middle of this heat. But look, this is a year for Stanford. They have a they kind of they have a schedule rhythm they don't like, quite frankly. They'd like to change it. They haven't been able to. In odd number of years though, their heavyweight games are all at home, with the notable exception of USC. But their North Division foes, Oregon is here. Washington is here. The big game with Cal is here. Non conference Notre Dame is here. So this is the year. If you're really going to make a push for Stanford, it's usually in the odd number of years. And they have a veteran returning quarterback, just like Herbert is in Eugene Costello here. That's a great point. And all these points you can hear with our partner series, XM College Sports, or subscribe to the Yogi Ross Show podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. But you make a great point about the heat, because they're going to go down and play Central Florida in Orlando, in heat that's different than the Bay Area. And I think it's, you can kind of ring the same tune in a few Pac-12 schools of September's brutal, right? SC, kind of the same deal. They got Fresno State, then they play Stanford. You know, everybody's got tough stretches. I don't remember a time when Stanford's had this type of stretch. Northwestern, USC, Central Florida to kick right. the thing off. Well, you hit it, Yoke. Just think, and, and this is one of the things I, th- I get frustrated about because you look around the country and you see what the SEC schools in particular do, which is they play four, you know, or, or I admit, that's not maybe fair, three out of their four non-conference games are joke games, quite frankly. They're just pay games and they buy wins out of it. And here's Stanford not only having to play the nine conference games, as everyone in the pack does, but their three non-conference games are against outstanding teams. There's not a lightweight in the group. And that is, that's what makes this year challenging. And you hit it. The, they have Northwestern here. They have Notre Dame here at the end of the year. But the game at UCF is going to be big because it isn't just heat, it's humidity. Yeah. It's that Florida late summer sweltering heat humidity that Stanford, there's just no way anybody out here can be used to. All right. So, you know, this program better than anybody in the country. And I think we both share the admiration for coach Shaw. What about him has made this place so special and so consistent over the entirety of his tenure. Well, that's the, the word you hit there, that it's consistency. And I, I know um, I've, I've spoken to Big 12 Commissioner Bob Bowlesby quite a bit about this. And Bob was the athletic director here that hired both Jim Harbaugh and David Shaw. And Bob has a great phrase about it. He said, when I hired Jim Harbaugh, I wouldn't have hired David Shaw. And when I hired David Shaw, I wouldn't have hired Jim Harbaugh. And it's brilliant because it was that Jim Harbaugh was the perfect man in 2007 to lift a program that was really struggling. And Harbaugh did a magnificent job of that in his four years. David Shaw came in and now he's pushing on a decade and he has not just maintained and sustained, but he's built on what Jim Harbaugh started here. And that is the great credit of David Shaw. Stanford has never in its football history... And they've had a lot of ups, but the ups have been very brief. They've never in a century plus had a sustained run like they've had now. And that's David Shaw's credit. It's stability. It is. Um, he has been a player. And if you as you have Yogi, we walk into David Shaw's office and you see the framed jerseys on his wall. He now has Andrew Luck as a third. But the first two were from Richard Sherman and Doug Baldwin. David Shaw was the guy that bonded with them when he was an assistant coach and really helped draw the best out of them who have both gone on to be brilliant professional players. That hook that David had as an assistant coach, he's maintained as the head coach. Um, And you know this as well. He's hired a great staff. And look, Stanford's recruiting pool, as everybody understands, is a lot smaller than most every other school in the country, but they still survived. And they've been able to get gems out of that pool enough to be a really good football program every year. I love it. All right, so we're going to stop getting out of the way. Let's go right into Coach Shaw's office and talk to the head coach of Stanford, David Shaw. From the office of Coach Shaw, David Shaw joins the show. Coach, thanks for taking the time. Good to be here. All right, so in the middle of training camp, I'm curious for you, because you're a coach, obviously, you've been here for a long time. Do you still feel like in camp sometimes you want to play? Like, does it get going a little bit? Uh, I think I've passed that point where, you know, I have the feeling of wanting to play. 
Um, but I still have that feeling of anticipation of energy of excitement, um, that you don't, I don't think you get, if you've never played, if you've coached, but you've never played, you get that feeling anyway, because you love it because you can't do it if you don't love it. But when you've played and you're on the grass and the period's starting and your song starts to play, you kind of <laughs> get that mojo. Um, and that's one of the things we, we love. You have to love the sport. And I tell our guys all the time, like if you're good at it and you don't love it and your juices don't flow, you'll never be great at it. You can't be great unless your juices are flowing and that's coaching or playing. Yeah. I feel like now, like in August, my workouts even get harder. Like I can't just go to yoga anymore. Like I got to throw, got to throw 95 pounds around, like not a lot of weight, but I need, I need some plates here and there. Always got to do extra in the fall. Yeah, seriously. Um, obviously we're going to talk about your team, but leadership, you know, I was here for the Campbell summit as well. Prior to going to practice today, Ted Robinson, my partner, huge part of that. You've been around Bill Campbell. You've been around great leaders. I, I love asking you about Bill Walsh. I feel like I do it every year how have you been able to curate and choreograph the leadership lessons you've gained from being around your dad, being around people like Bill Campbell, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, that is a great question. And what I've done over time, I kind of have different documents on my computer, different things that I've kind of kept and reminded myself. As you see my desk, I got a bunch of different post-it notes and different things I've written down. I've got things from uh, a talk with magic Johnson to all these other things. And, for me, it's about the situation, you know, to find something that like great words are great anytime, but I think they hold when you give them to the guys at the right time, right? When things are tough or, or when things are great and you give them something that they can hold on to because it fits the situation and like a song that comes on during a memorable moment, we always remember that song. Well, now if I can give them the right words at the right time, whether they're from me or from somebody else, it doesn't matter, but that helps, helps cement uh, the point that I'm trying to make at the time. Um, so timing for me is, is a big deal. That, that feel, cause it, even as a head coach, you know, we've been able to chronicle the program, uh, on the drive. We've been out here at different moments. You hear a speech from you. I, I click into that of like, how did you develop knowing when was the right time? Was it just feel and, and innate cause you've been around the game forever or did it take you a couple seasons to figure out when and what button, buttons to push? So that's another great question. Um, there's a little bit of feel, um, which for me, and I go back to another great leader that I was around, which had a huge influence on my life, John Gruden. And because John would talk about play calling, play calling is a combination of your study and your gut, right? It's a combination of both. And what you're talking about is kind of the same thing. If you're around it long enough, you, you kind of have an idea of what a team needs, but then it's also a feeling. You get to know your team. You get to know the feeling of practice. Um, what I've had, what I had to do, honestly, a few years ago, I had to take myself out of the individual periods, right? I'm an old receiver, and I coach quarterbacks. I love to jump in the quarterback or receiver individual periods. Um, now for me, I, I, I walk around practice, and I get a sense of all the positions. I think it's good for them to see me standing outside and watching, you know, their D line individual drills that I'm interested in and I'm watching, I'm critiquing. Hopefully they they're at their best because I'm watching. Um, but it also helps me give me a sense of what we're doing and how we're doing so that, you know, like yesterday we had a, a not, not great period. And I felt just, I felt it from the previous period that I had to address it. I address, address it as a mass and practice got better from there. Because I know uh, the guys needed to hear me say that, that this is important, that just because we're three weeks out, this practice still matters. Like this practice, this period still matters. We still have to be improving. And I put it on our seniors and our leaders, you know, and they picked up practice from there. So I think it's having an idea to a certain degree, having a, just a great feel uh, as a coach, but then also having a feel for your team, which for a lot of coaches, I think it's tough um, because you have to get outside of yourself. It's not just what I want to have happen. That they, they can't be the reason. It has to be, what do these guys need to be at their best? Do they need me to back off a little bit because they're doing well and to let the guys go? Or do I need to have, do I have to come in and maybe make a slight course correction um, and then step back out? That's how, that's how I view it. That, that's really profound. I think athletes now want to get coached 
uh, hard's like a very easy term to throw out, but because I can't think of a better one right now, I'll say that. But like they want to get coached and told and and called out because it's an era where it doesn't happen as often. Maybe not necessarily for Stanford guys, but overall. And, and I say that on the heels. I just talked to KJ. Or we're going to go talk to KJ Costello. And prior to our interview, I, I saw him outside and I said, "What are you most excited about?" And he's like, "Discernment, like developing discernment." And I, I think of that. It, that clearly came from you. And that word is your word. How has he done that? And how have you been able to say, this is when I need to teach it to him versus, hey, just be able to say the play? With quarterbacks, and you and I have had this conversation over the years, with quarterbacks, there's a, there's a for me, is a long progression of first thing I do as a quarterback, because we're one of the few people, few teams that huddle, you got to be able to go in the huddle and not embarrass yourself, right? <laughs> That's the first thing you got to do, be able to go in there, spit the play out, out of your mouth and break the huddle without guys rolling their eyes, right? That's the first thing you got to do. You got to earn respect in there. Um, and then, you know, then you truly have these type to learn a sense of command. So now you're not just the guy in the huddle calling the play. You're now telling the guy what the guys, what the play is with conviction. So that play is going to work, right? You have to call it with conviction. You're a salesman at that time. Hey, I'm calling this play. I believe in it. You got to believe in it. It's going to work. Right. And then that next step for me, um, which is where I think KJ was last year, which is he could do both of those and he go out there and play and, and play great, make some great plays. And now for me, he's on that kind of that final step of, okay, have you mastered it? Do you have it all now? Right. To where, uh, if I decide not to come out to practice, KJ's got it right are we at that level? And that's, that's to me where he's, he's got to be to where now, Hey, you know what? Coach Shaw isn't here, but guess what? Practice is going to be even better. Cause I'm running the show, right? You'd love for your quarterback to have that kind of command. And if a guy's not sure of something, he's the guy that goes there and corrects it. No, I need you to get a little bit deeper, right? Cause it's not going to time out with my drop. Like to have that feel of not just running the plays, but now I can manipulate the offense. Um, and that's why I think he's getting really, really close to, having preferences of, Hey, you know, gosh, should we put a backside, uh, Oscar on the backside here? Or should we put something else? You know, cause I think I want to come back and throw the out backside the, the, having those conversation. I think that's where he is. And I'm hoping that shows this year when he plays. That's, that's awesome. I think it's easy to say senior quarterback guy who's played a lot. They're going to be a good team, but with everything you just said, it leads me to ask, have you seen him elevate other people, whether it's Walker little, who's a dude, or whether it's, Drew Dahlman or whether it's one of your who's going to be the next back like have you seen that part of it happen versus just him play well because he's been doing it uh, I, I've seen it um, I, I want to see it when we're in season also but I've seen it in the off season because we talk a lot about standards and holding guys to standards and he and our leaders right now have done probably the best job we've had in the last few years of holding themselves accountable and holding each other accountable and now, for him especially, you want the quarterback to be the guy. Now he's not just the guy on the offense. Yeah. Now he's talking to the defensive guys. You know, now he's pointing out things, whether it's positive or negative. Hey, yeah, Curtis, just like that. That was awesome. Or, hey, no, we need more from you. So he's not just the offensive guy now. He's like the team guy. And they respond to him. They listen to him because he's putting his heart in there. He's trying to do everything right. And he's pushing them to do the same. Wow. Okay, I got to ask about defense before I let you go. You lose at least two linebackers, super productive. Uh, you got players that everybody doesn't necessarily know who they are today, but I know you were pumped about them coming out of spring. Secondary, I think you have best corner on the West Coast, one of the best in the country. How do you see that group coming together? Because when you've won, that, that, that group, they, they rose up. So uh, this offseason, I talked a lot about the team, what we're trying to do, and I tried to be very specific. And, um, you know, we have a phrase around here called party in the backfield. And we've kind of gotten away from, from that a little bit. And we haven't had it as much. But as you alluded to, when we've been good, hey, we're stopping the run and we're hitting the quarterback. Right? That's the two best measures of a great defense. Can you stop the run and hit the quarterback? You're going to win a lot of football games. Uh, and I think we're getting close to that. Right? Casey Tuhill is coming as a fifth-year senior, best shape of his life. I think we've got an outstanding group of outside linebackers. I'm excited about our inside linebacking core where we just moved Curtis Robinson in there. A couple of young guys, Ricky Maison and Jacob Mango for our guys are going to, you're going to hear a lot about over the next couple of years. I think our front seven has a chance to be exciting. And then we just brought in a bunch of young DBs also 
and Paulson Adebo is kind of the standard, and these guys are pushing themselves to hopefully be on that level. So I think for the next few years, we're going to have some athletes back there, and uh, I'm excited about what it could be for our football team. I love it. I know you got a really fun schedule to kick the thing off, but as we're in training camp, last question, Coach, how much fun do you have in camp? It's not the dog days like it was when we played. There's no triple sessions, but you're still in it. How much joy do you get out of this experience? I miss the dog days, and anybody can laugh and say, well, you're a coach, of course. You're not putting the pads on twice a day in 90-degree in temperatures. Um, but there's a there's a hardening that happens. There's a difficult thing you have to go through to become a great team. Um, and to answer your question, I do love it. I do have fun. I do enjoy it because if you don't enjoy the process, um, I think you're missing something because you spend most of your time in the process. Very little time at the end, right? So you got to enjoy the process. I love football. I love the the idea of going out there and making ourselves better, helping young guys achieve their goals, being hard on them and raising a standard. And I tell these guys all the time, I, I don't owe them anything. I don't owe you anything. The 30-year-old version of you, that's the guy that I owe. The guy that can come back to me and say, hey, coach, thank you for raising my standards. Thank you for not letting me give anything less than 100%. So that's the guy that I, that, um, that I owe everything to. So that's the guy that I'm going to try to please as I'm pushing you today. I love that. Have you been able to watch Hard Knocks at all? Just because you referenced Gruden, I got to ask. I have. I have. It is entertaining. <laughs> it is classic. <laughs> all right. We'll talk about that one offline. We're going to let you go, Coach. Appreciate it. Coming up next is his star quarterback. He alluded to KJ Costello. All right, Ted. I know we start our day very similarly with a cup of coffee. Kona Red Coffee, so pumped, the proud partner on this podcast. And Kona Red, and you like Hawaii, it comes right from the volcanic mountain slopes of Hawaii. And I'm curious for you as a coffee guy, would you rather roasted beans? Are you a cold brew guy? Because Kona Red has it all. Yeah, no, uh, look, Yogi's Joe, I am so grateful that you've introduced me to Kona Joe, because I mean, <laughs> my goodness, what a fact. I'm, I'm a roasted bean guy. I love to grind it myself in the kitchen in the morning on the road. I'll grind some and put it in a, in a little Ziploc and take it with me. So, you know, when I open up the bag in the morning, I still get, and there's <laughs> nothing, there is nothing like the aroma of Kona coffee. Uh, I heard that. Check them out at KonaRed.com. Cold brew, premium coffee beans. They even have a Hawaiian cascara juice. They bring you, I think, the best coffee on earth. I love watching film with it, and I love it on the road, and Ted and I will have it on the road with us all season long. If you want to buy it on the road, check it out at Vons, Albertsons, Pavilions, Ralph's, Bristol Farms, Sprouts, and many more, or just go to KonaRed.com. All right, that's the spiel on why you should be rocking Kona Red coffee, and now we're going to talk to some stars in KJ Costello and Paul Sanadivo. There's something special about being at Stanford. I think there's something even more special about being around the quarterback at Stanford. KJ Costello, man, thanks for joining us on the podcast tour. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Heck yeah. So I want to start with your wrist because you've got a wristband on that says never, ever give up. It's about kids fighting childhood cancer. Ted and I have been around a bunch of those kids over our years as a broadcaster. Why are you wearing it and what type of impact has it had on you? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm actually wearing this in particular. You know, Super Kate, Kate Spinello, uh, gave this to me back at the Elite 11. You remember when uh, that was the first time I actually met him. Um, and it was something just about him that struck me when I heard him tell his story. Um, you know, I'd never really had a kid at that age tell a story of such. Um, and then kind of just see the joy in his eyes, like running around. It was just, I don't know, I never really had a little brother. You know, never had a brother in general. Um, so it was just pretty awesome to kind of see the impact um, you know, Cade was able to have on me, you know, I brought him to my high school, you know, and, and as he tells his story, I look around at all the other kids looking the same way that I looked. Um, so, you know, it's impacted me and, and just inspiring me. You know, I think it's incredible um, that a kid going, th you know, battling through what he has um, is able to inspire kids much, much older than him, two, three times older than him in, uh, you know, his life. But um, yeah, he's a, he's an inspiration to all you know he's done incredible work yeah. kj how much uh, you're a returner and, and we're in a weird year i think in the league there aren't as many returning starters at quarterback as there might be in past years uh, give, give us a sense how you think you've improved where you think you're a better quarterback now than the first day you stepped on this campus yeah that's a good question um 
you know, I think one of the main reasons why I came to Stanford, I was fortunate enough to be recruited semi early. I was able to actually look into offensive schemes and stuff like that. And I knew that, you know, I loved throwing the football, but I wanted to go win football games. So I want to be in a system where I was, you know, most likely to win. You know, I played high school football, threw for a lot of yards, and, you know, we lost you know more often than we never won a championship um because we we just weren't able to we we had to throw the football Mm -hmm. you know so now coming to a system where we're trying to be in the most advantageous play we've subtly changed over the years you know with uh, coach bloomgren leaving and carberry coming on on board but it's still the philosophy is the same um so to answer your question quickly um now going into my fourth year um the scheme, my progressions, things like that is, is, is second nature. Um, now it's how fast can I move through progressions? Hmm. You know, how fast can, how can I anticipate, um, number th- how can I get the ball to three and four in a progression? Just because I know pre-snap based on the look that one A, one B is, is highly likely not going to be good. Um, so basically playing ahead of the game, but also not playing too fast, um, and not having too much respect for defenses in terms of everyone doing their assignments. Um, and really just taking completions and, and avoiding as many negative plays as possible. So I'm here with a wide receiver, Yogi. Now, you just had two terrific veteran wide receivers that have moved on and yeah. a terrific tight end that's all moved on. Yeah. So how have you worked on developing relationships with the new <laughs> Receivers. This it's year. been my favorite question yeah. of the off season. Yeah. Um, I had a tremendous time, you know, learning football, learning a new definition of open with JJ and, and <laughs> yeah. Trent. And you know, I came up here freshman year. I I couldn't like I was going through progressions and running like mm-hmm. every other snap. You know, not even throwing the football because nobody was open. You know, and slowly but surely, Coach Shaw started to basically just tell me like hey throw the football you know what i'm saying like like if you get one-on-one in these situations and then i started you know me being me i try to find out like okay i'm gonna throw into these coverages where they may not have a step on them but now i gotta put it where i don't want the guy to tip it or put the ball in a risky situation so that was one thing that we'll carry over with guys like colby parkinson and semi fahoku's had a had a hell of an off season um he kind of reminds me a lot of jj but he's in his own way he's just a little bit more explosive and stuff like over the top um but the the thing about this group that excites me most is the versatility and the yard the the uh, opportunity for like yards after catch i mean mike wilson is an absolute stud workhorse him and connor the guys are catching jugs running routes doing working more than anybody i've seen in my time here um and being able to spit the ball out throw them screens turn our intermediate run game into just a quick pass and potentially get a minimum of four plus on first down we call that efficient um just being able to find ways to you know get the ball out and let these guys make make plays with their feet is something that you haven't seen a whole lot of out of stanford and we may see a little bit out of it this year I love that. I had this memory flash back to me because here we are on your campus. We're going to watch practice. And I can remember your first camp, first training camp. And we talked afterwards on the side. And you're like, I, I think I might start. Like, I feel like I could run this <laughs> offense. And, yeah. and clearly that, that wasn't the case. Yeah. But when you think back to then, right, you, and yeah. you, every quarterback, I hope, but we'd like to think with certainty is, is confident in their ability and their ability to play at a high level. Yeah. You had that then. Yeah. But when you look back, like the reality of where you were, efficiency, anticipation, instinct, all this stuff, because this is not yeah. play catch. Like Stanford, yeah. you got to play quarterback yeah. in a different yeah. way. So from then to now, four years later, how have you, in your eyes, evolved the most? Man, I think just quickly what jumps to mind is being an unemotional decision maker. Um somebody that's that's confident that loves to you know throw the ball downfield that loves to make big plays i realized that you know in my four years here i mean if if we really are trying to dictate the tempo and not turn the football over but still make make big plays like there's there's time and a place to to you know a big word that also comes to mind is discernment knowing when to make you know that aggressive that aggressive move but, you know, me being a freshman thinking that I know the progressions to now is the fact that if I really don't like something, no matter what, if it's JJ or whoever it is, 
I got more trust in the backside of the progression than, than trying to force it early on. Um, and even check downs, you know, I remember my first year playing, I, I literally did not hit one check down, you know, just being so trustworthy in like the early parts of the progression. And yeah. in the last two years, started hitting running backs and realizing that that's a huge, huge part of the game. Yogi, we were here last year for the Washington State game. And we know for a decade, right, from Gerhardt through Taylor through McCaffrey and now Bryce, Stanford had defied a lot of its history. This was a lot of running. Yeah. Washington State game, what happened last year, KJ? Nine of the first ten plays were pass plays. I had a dad text me in the stands. (laughs) He couldn't during the game. Remember, Yogi? He couldn't believe it. Nine of the first ten were pass plays. Is that the omen for 2019? Well, you know, we like to say we're going to take what the defense (laughs) gives us. I mean, you know, we did have Bryce Law. I think it was the seventh game of the year. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we, we... we knew we had one of the best backs in the country, so our identity was definitely tied into establishing that early on and then playing off of that. Um, and I think it was kind of around that game um, where we kind of reestablished our identity to be a little bit more of maybe a pass first early on, and then Bryce started really taking off. Um, but, yeah, we actually came out in basically two-minute type offense just trying to loosen things up. We hadn't scored uh, first drive all game except for SC week two. So it was six weeks. We are one for five in our goal of scoring the first drive. So we just threw a little bit of curveball, and I, I love two-minute offense. It's, you know, it's a little bit different than a typical pro style, but it, it allowed us to find a rhythm early. How do you discern, right? Love that word, discernment. We'll be using that one. We'll be stealing that one for the press box this season for Ted and I. But how do you discern and deal with hype, expectations, standards that you have for yourself, and joy and having fun with your teammates in presumptually your final season? Yeah. Well, I mean, not to, not to toot your horn, Yogi, but I remember... Uh, you talking at the Pac-12 Media Day about, um, you know, the ability to learn at a faster clip um, when you're doing it with joy. And I've actually been thinking about that the past couple weeks, just in general training camp. It's really hard. And and telling young guys that, you know, they're not really necessarily having fun right now in training camp because they're screwing up over and over as expected. Um, But you know, going into the season, expectations, I still, I always refer back to guys that came before me. You know, Christian, I remember watching him. You know, he said, hype, expectations. Like, what is hype and expectations when your standard and your process doesn't change? You know, and he was he was a guy that did the same thing all the time. We're lucky around here. There's not a, there's not a whole lot of pressure on us. We're just, we're kids going to school and playing football. Um, I'm sure it's a little bit different in L.A. and these other places, but to be completely honest I do not feel <laughs> any bit of that um, that's just maybe the Stanford bubble or, or something else but um, we, we want to win a championship I do I've been here four years haven't haven't uh, touched foot yet we went to the Pac-12 championship but we defined our uh, our objective goals four months back normally we do it right now kind of around training camp time and with Coach Turley leaving, Coach Carroll suggested we do it way, way back. And to to see it in the young guys four years before, or sorry, four months before season was even close to starting. Hey, we got to win the North. We got to win the Pac-12 title. We got to win the Rose Bowl. And it was very clear that that was my expectations and everybody else who signed up for it. And uh, I think we have a pretty good shot at doing so. Yeah. Who's the Stanford quarterback you've learned the most from? Hmm. Well, Todd Husak likes to tell me. What yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have spent a little bit of time with Husak. Yeah. Um, Rose Bowl. I remember. Yeah, absolutely. I remember, you know, I grew up seriously. I'm honest. I was a huge USC fan, huge mm-hmm. Carson Palmer fan, Sanchez, Liner, all those guys. And then I started watching SC playing Stanford with luck. Right. And it was just, it was something about, you know, seeing him like operate the machine without necessarily a bunch of talent he was just there's something about him that was just very technical um and he obviously had a bunch of talent but i watched a lot of him and surprisingly hogan doing it at a very 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 humble with a very very humble manner i mean he was running the system insanely well um i mean those two guys are the most recent that i've uh, really followed a lot um, at least in the past five to six years. I like that. Humble that you picked that up because that's exactly Kevin Hogan did it without any fanfare, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he, you know, 
they won a lot of ball yeah. games, man. Yes. <laughs> I, I go around and look around, and you know, I in I I don't think he lost more than five six games in his entire four year career. Mm-hmm. Um, won two Rose Bowls, I believe. Mm-hmm. Went to three. Um, yeah, they won a lot of football, um, mm-hmm. and he was just doing it the right way. He was just doing his job. I love it. Well, it's been fun to watch you do it the right way. I think you're a great example for the next generation of quarterbacks. And I know Ted and I, we love calling your games. So we'll wish you nothing but the best. Stay healthy. Have a heck of a year, man. Enjoy it. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. That's KJ Costello. We'll be back with more. How red is ball training camp tour rolls on. Okay, from one of the top quarterbacks in the country to one of the top defenders. But you were one of the top wide receivers at one point. Paulson Adebo joins us. Uh, first and foremost, have you ever done a podcast before, or do you listen to podcasts? Um, I wouldn't say I listen to podcasts, but I listen to like, interviews on YouTube, so it's kind of the same format. Fair. Joe, I mean, Joe Rogan. I listen to that. So. Yeah, he's a, he's a fan favorite. People yeah. really dig Joe Rogan. I get it. Um, all right, so for you, coming out of you know Texas... Mm-hmm. Dallas, why why did you come here? I mean, you were highly recruited, receiver, one time committed to another school. What what made you flip and and the light come on and say, whoa, I get to maybe go to that place? I think um, I had a running back that uh, went to my school that came here, Stephon Taylor, had a really good career career here, and that was kind of my first introduction to Stanford. As far as flipping from Notre Dame, um, I knew early on that I wanted to go to a school of a top tier academics. So I was looking at schools like Duke, Notre Dame, uh, Stanford, was looking at Northwestern for a little bit. So Stanford didn't end up offering me until late my senior year. So Notre Dame was kind of the, the first ones to offer me. So I kind of jumped on that. And then uh, Stanford offered me later on and then kind of just came down to do I want to live in California? Mm. Do I want to live in Indiana? So. <laughs> hey, Ted, hey, former Notre Dame, yeah. you made the right decision living in California, Ted. Yeah. Well, yeah, someone who lives three miles from here, yes, I'd say that. So, but Paulson, right. since you referenced it, academics first before we do football, um, Andrew Luck has told me this multiple times when he was here that what mm. blew him away was he would sit in a classroom. And he was the least accomplished person <laughs> in any classroom that he sat in at Stanford, right? This is an all-American quarterback right, saying right, that. Right. So give me, if you had an experience like that in the, in the, in the away from football in your time at Stanford. Away from football. It's definitely a little bit of a shock just because in high school, I was always one of the smarter kids in my class coming here. Obviously, there's a 5% acceptance rate. So mm-hmm. everybody who's here is brilliant at something, um, whether it be music or some form of art master of mathematics or mm-hmm. whatever field they're in um so being in a class you're always surrounded by people that you can learn something from um i think it's hard for us sometimes we're kind of coming from a football world or we just came out of meetings kind of sluggish so it's, i think it's it's hard for us but we need to um kind of carry that same excitement into the classroom every day so i try to do that and uh, it's been a good experience so far i can imagine one of our favorite experiences is coming to practice and coming early and watching people do their thing early. Right, right. And I can remember your freshman year, we came here. And, I mean, we're about 90 minutes prior to practice. I'm surprised we're getting this interview because usually you'd be on the field right now, I right. feel like, getting ready for practice. <laughs> well, where, where did that begin for you? And even staying late, I mean, it, there's been a couple guys here. Trent Nerman was one of them. We knew him. We didn't know you, your freshman year. I was like, who, who's, who's that guy out there? Wondering where that began for you. So, for me, it was just trying to give myself the edge. So, coming in... My freshman year obviously didn't play, but I thought that if, if there was any way for me to plus my game, I'd have to look at the older guys. So looking at Trent Irwin, who was out there an hour early, I used to think 30 minutes was early, and then i come and see him an hour early. I said, okay, I got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to model my game after the older guys, people who uh, kind of set the ground for me, Justin Reed, Quinn Meeks, Elijah Holder, all the older guys who really just took me under their wing and kind of showed me how to work coming in as a freshman. So uh, I think everybody coming from high school thinks they know how to work hard, but uh, when you come to college, you kind of see the difference between people who kind of work hard and people who really dedicate their lives to try to try to be great. So trying to emulate the people that I saw going out, putting in the extra work, I think that's where it came from. You've heard about Richard Sherman, right, Paulson? <laughs> heard about I've Richard heard about Sherman, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> is, is, that, is that what he went through? Now, of course, he actually played receiver when he right. first came to Stanford before he got switched. Has that been something you've ever looked at as something of a model? 
for to, you playing. Everybody wants to be offense, right? Right, right, and right. You're, and you're a guy that's chosen to stand out on defense. So I grew up playing receiver was probably mm-hmm. my primary position until mm-hmm. really all of my life until maybe my senior year where I kind of focused in a little bit on, on DB. But for the most part, I was kind of a receiver. So I think that's helped me a lot as far as um, trying to make plays on the ball. So I don't know if I look at that as uh, motivation or anything, but I definitely do see it. And mm-hmm. you can you can see um, how it can help you to be able to play the ball and kind of have a receiver's mindset as far as when people are running routes. I kind of remember some things that I used to do and can kind of tell uh, certain tells that receivers do that maybe other DBs can't. I don't know. Did you ever watch any of your highlights? Because I just have in my mind, like, Ted calling that sweet pick in the Cal game last year, <laughs> the one-handed grab. like Right. <laughs> so I try not to watch it too much. Just so it's bigger. pretty good, though. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while. It's, it's cool okay, to look okay so take us inside. You know, both of us were offensive players way back in our time. M- mindset of a corner. You always hear, like, you got to be able to erase and go to the next snap. But you're getting tutored and coached by w- not just one of the best. Like, I don't even think people argue that right. Dwayne Aquina is the best secondary coach in the history of college football. Right. Curious how that, that shaped you. And he's got an offensive background as well as yeah. a player. So w- where is that? And, and take all of us because we dream to play man-to-man coverage at times and none of us can like you. Exactly. So being, being under Coach Aquina, he teaches us way more than just the technique part of it, but more so the conceptually learning the – what the offense is doing, what the offense is trying to do, different tendencies. So having him on the sideline, he'll give us certain tips like if you see this split, take this shade, mm-hmm. certain certain tips like that that have, that have really helped me and kind of plus my game in that aspect that maybe if I was with a, another coach, I wouldn't have. So definitely credit Coach Aquino for most of the success I've had here. Who was your biggest challenge to cover last year? I think there were a ton of great receivers that I played against. I think um, the kid at Oregon was really good, Mitchell. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, obviously, Nikhil Harry was a great receiver. Right. That's uh, where I was wondering if you were going to mention yeah. his name. I think That's I, I think I played against a lot of great receivers mm-hmm. last year. I didn't really focus too much on their names. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's spoken like yeah. a pure DB. But exactly. How was it to? I mean, we want, we love calling your games. And it's like red zone, Stanford's going to throw it up to one of those monsters on the outside. For you as a defender, how does that sharpen your sword? You know, last couple of years, you've had some talented players on the next level. Now you've got Colby Parkinson, some new players, Seema Vahoku, that maybe the country doesn't know, but, but surely will once you guys get going. But how do guys like that, deep ball, playing the ball, help somebody like you with an offensive background? For sure. So I think the unique thing about – our wide receiver group is we have so many different types. So we have big body types who can run fast, guys that will just box you out, speed guys, uh, a guy like Kobe Parkinson who's not the fastest guy but knows how to get at, in and out of his cuts and you don't really know exactly how to guard him because he's 6'9", so you have to kind of have find a different way to guard every single receiver. So it, it exposes you to different types of receivers. So I think that helps us a lot um, as opposed to certain offenses who maybe only have one kind of receiver and just kind of stick with that. So seeing a different kind of receiver every day when we're doing one-on-ones, you can go against different people and learn different techniques and say, okay, this works against him, this doesn't work against him. So when you see a certain body type or a certain receiver type in the game, you can kind of relate it to something you've seen before. You watch Sunday football, obviously. What do you think about this review of pass interference penalties now? <laughs> would you want that? In, would you want that in the Pac-12? Only if they're going to call the offensive one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, That's what I want to do. They hear. probably won't. But it's, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I hear you there. Um, you you burst onto the scene, and rightfully so, and, and played at a really high level. H- how do you now deal with expectations around your play for an entire off season, heading into the year, knowing you're one of the top corners? potentially in the country? Um, I think personally, the expectations of others, is, it doesn't really... I always think that I have the highest expectations for myself. So anything that anybody else expects of me, I'll probably already expect more. So I don't think that pressure is, is too much. Uh, I think it's good to be under pressure. Um, to be honest, I just play as hard as I can and then let the chips fall where they may. So. And does this Coach Shaw talk to you guys about that? Because i got to imagine someone with his experience... Well, we always talk about it like, man, if there's some guys you want to play for, I'd love to, to have it be Coach Shaw. I'm sorry. I didn't so so how, has he, how has he guided you around mindset, around when, 
when people expect certain things for you or when your expectation is really high? Like, how does he talk about how you can continue to elevate your game? For sure, just ma- maintaining the same work ethic you had to get here as far as not switching things up because things are going good. So work, working like things are going bad. So the same mindset that I had coming in as a freshman, trying to earn my spot, trying to work as hard as I can so I can prove to the team that I could be on the field is the same mindset I have now and I should continue to have. So just keeping that mindset. And then as far as expectations of others, not really focusing focusing in too hard on it, knowing that at the end of the day, we play for our teammates, not for anybody else. So keeping everything in-house and knowing that if I put my best forward, my best foot forward and play as hard as I can for my teammates, whatever happens is, is cool with the team. Mm-hmm. What was the place you enjoyed playing the most last year, other than Stanford Stadium? <laughs> um, I liked playing at Notre Dame. I was thought there was going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was probably my favorite place to play. And then second would probably be Oregon. Oregon, that's the other yeah. one I thought. Yeah, because you had a chance to go to a lot of great places last right. year. This year you get them all here. Yeah. You looking right. forward to that, having a lot of you – know, the, the Stanford schedule is such that this year you have a blockbuster slate of home games. Right. I personally prefer playing on the road Do you? in the in the environment where people are against you, but it would be cool playing here and having our fans here as well. So it doesn't That's really so matter. Good. All right, so before I let you go, what what do you love the most about this game? I think grow, growing up, it was just a way for me to just kind of have fun. I grew up playing multiple sports, so play football, basketball, track, at one point in time, I thought I was going to be a basketball player. We probably all thought we were going to be something. <laughs> but I think eventually just owning in on it. And when I started playing just DB, just kind of realizing that at, at first I, at first I wanted to be on offense because everybody wants to score touchdowns. But then realizing how important the DB position is as far as erasing touchdowns, um, playing top down, not giving things up over the top. So realizing how much of an impact you can have on the game without necessarily scoring um, so so many touchdowns or having every exciting play and kind of just realizing what exactly wins games and not always the flashiness of it, but being technically sound, being in your right gaps, being run, uh, run sound as far as not jumping a gap, not jumping contain, keeping, keeping all those things. So that's mostly been – from uh, Coach Aquino's teaching, and it's kind of really just in re- re- reinforced the love I have for the game, I, I'd say. Wow. That's impre- that's, that's as good of an answer as you're going to find for a defender. Awesome. We appreciate the time. Wishing you. you nothing but the best. Stay healthy. Good luck. We can't wait to watch you guys get it rolling. Thank you so much. All right. Paulson Adebo, Ted Robinson, I'm Yogi Roth. Be right back and wrap it up. Well, there it is. What a day from the farm. Talk to Coach Shaw. He was awesome. Talked about leadership, people he's been around, the trillion dollar coach. It was Bill Campbell, who, who you obviously knew really well. Talked to quarterback KJ Costello, Paulson Adibo. I mean, next level dudes on every level. And then got a chance to watch him practice. Takeaways, Ted. And they survived. Well, look, the, 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 the thing that I think we'll all watch this year, Yog, is can Stanford be as physical as they've been through the David Shaw era? And I think they need to regain a little bit of the offensive line juice that they had. This program has had an awfully good series of offensive linemen. And last year, it may have just fallen a notch. If they get that back with the schedule we talked about up top, then this could be an awfully fun year around here. And I know one thing, after watching practice in 90 degrees, cold brew. Kona Red, let's go. I love you. You're the best. So, so does Kona Red. It'll be your house shortly. And for everybody else, just go to KonaRed.com. Um, my big takeaway was KJ not only has elevated his command, his understanding, but that has elevated everybody. You know, Coach Shaw told us that he's become the voice of the team, not just the offense. And that was evident, I think, when you watch how this team competes. And they're going to have a tough road. And, and I think in this era, Ted, I think it's great to have a Northwestern to kick it off. SC week to go on the road to UCF, who's got a huge chip on their shoulder still week three. I think it's going to bode, wet, bode extremely well for this program moving forward. Yeah, no question. And, then, and look, that's something Stanford doesn't shy away from. And that's as long as David has been here, Stanford's trade has been to schedule pretty fun. I mean, look, they play Notre Dame every year. So immediately they have nine conference plus Notre Dame. So you know you're not going to see a bunch of lightweight schools. They don't shy away from that. And, and I love that. Um, and you know, like I think we heard it, I, I, especially Paulson Adebo struck me because here's a guy that said, I was looking to go to a school that was high level academics and high level football. Um, they get that. 
you don't come here to play, you know, Division three schools, no offense, but that's not what you come here to do. And I, I think you could hear that in Paulson's voice. They're okay with this. They'll, they'll be ready. I love that. And I love you, man. I can't wait to get going. Amen. Hey, man. We need a game on the farm. Yeah, no, we, we always have a blast when we come here. All right, so that, that's going to be it from the farm. Ted Robinson, I'm Yogi Roth. If you love podcasts, we got one coming out. It's going to come out every Monday. It's going to be Ted and Yogi's Pac-12 Adventure. We're going to take you all over, recap the weekend that was, look forward a little bit to the weekend that is. It's going to be quick, 30 minutes, in and out, Ted. I can't wait to get rolling with you. Well, I can't wait because we start in Seattle, right? I'm taking my Kona Red up to the place. There's another coffee company I've I heard of that. that is, is some, some presence in Seattle. Not after we get done. Oh, I love it. All right. That's Ted Robinson. If you want more football, just go to yogiroth.com. We got a newsletter every Friday. The How Great Is Ball newsletter. Articles, podcasts, insights from Ted and I from the road. All the links to our shows will be in there as well. That being said, I'm hopping on a plane. The How Great Is Ball training camp tour rolls on. Peace. Peace.